This quote by Maurice Dennis, who was a French painter and a decorative artist and writer um, in the 1890s, is sort of the basis for my talk today. And it says, it is well to remember that a picture before being a battle horse, a nude woman, or some anecdote is essentially a plain surface covered with colors and assembled in a certain order. Most of us understand that to illustrate a book means to provide it with pictures. That's certainly true, but I find it kind of limiting. Today, I hope to open your mind to a world of illustrated possibilities that come with assembling the plain surface and the colors and lines in an order that is closer to the second definition of illustrate, which is to explain or make something clear. So my focus is to use illustration in all of its many hundreds of thousands of forms to make your writing more clear. Using this definition of illustrate, you might come quickly to understand that the simple act of taking the time to in intentionally involve the white space on your pages is an act of illustration. So my first tip for you is words on a page surrounded by nothing more than lots of white space makes people look. And that is a form of illustration. Adopting a wider margin than the standard on your pages of memoir or poetry gives your reader the immediate idea that these words are not just plopped on this page in the usual manner. They've been framed, they've been accentuated, and these words have been highlighted. If you were to try using the wider margins for all the pages of your book, you immediately give people the impression that this book is somewhat different from others that they've read. You could accentuate a few pages in this way to call special attention to just those pages. Or if you have just one really important page, you can condense the text more to the center and put this white space frame around it so that people know that this is a very special page. This could be good for, you know, possibly putting um, a letter, an important letter on the page or, or some, you know, or a poem that was particularly meaningful to you. My next white space tip is changing the color of the white space creates a mood or expectation. And this too is illustration. And I'm hoping that all of you know that the white space is actually the space around your text or your object or, or image. So it doesn't matter what color it is, um, and that changes the mood of the page. Tip number three refers to this triangle. So is there a triangle on this page? because of how cleverly I arrange the text, or is it because of how ingeniously I arrange the white space? Well, the answer is, of course, that it's both. And this is also an illustration, and now we're sort of moving into the realm of what most people see as illustration. You've got a shape on the page. Any image, including shapes, and text in the shape of shapes is an illustration but it's the white space and how it's used around, behind, and from the image that sends the message. When you're thinking about illustrating your book, one of my most important tools is the white space. I have a lot of fun with the white space, and it's important, and its importance to the design of your cover and your book pages cannot be overstated. But I'm going to assume that most of you who stuck around for this talk kind of wanted to learn something about getting actual pictures into your work. That takes me to how pictures work. And that takes me back to the very beginning, which is literally the first slide that I show you, showed you. If we were in a room, I would actually ask for people to shout out what they saw on that first slide now that you've had a couple slides past it. But I can't do that here. So if you all just try to think back to the image you saw, the very first slide, and recall the elements that really stood out for you. And we'll take another look at it. If I've done my job correctly, the first thing that jumped out at you was the title. Then you should have noticed that I had a little fun with the copyright symbol. 
Because this is a picture attached to a mark that is familiar and important to writers, it's likely that you will remember this part long after you've forgotten the title of the talk. But that's okay, because as you remember this bit of fun that I've had, I've increased my chances that you'll also remember that it came from my talk that was online at Southwest Writers. The choice of Comic Sans as a title font further accentuates the expectation of lightness and the possibility of an easygoing time. But maybe not. Let's look at this black background and the kind of obscured blue letters. These two together provide a vehicle for pushing the white title letters to the front of the page. This background additionally, subliminally, tells you that this could maybe have a more serious aspect. So which is it? Is it serious or is it fun? I'm calling it a mystery. So as we go along, I have, I have tips, obviously, and I have three activities for you to do. So this first activity is about the power of images. Images have power. They have the power to sell, the power to evoke strong emotion in a single glance, the power to inspire unreasonable loyalty to a brand, a politician, or a sports team for even generations. Your writing deserves at least one good image. So starting with this page, we're gonna pretend that you want this one good image to go on the cover of your book. Here's my activity. If you don't already have an elevator pitch for your book, make one. Write it down and underline the adjectives you've used and the nouns they modify. These are the words that reveal the mood, color, and subjects that will translate to the best imagery for your book. The cover image you choose can make or break sales of your self-published book. And I say self-published because, as Bennett Cole, our June 6th speaker, mentioned, if you opt for, opt for a mainstream publisher, the art decisions will most likely be taken out of your hands. But if you opt for self-publishing, with a few exceptions, you can probably have 100% control over your cover and other art decisions. However, even a mainstream publisher can be influenced by your choice of a good, solid image that shows you understand the concept of connotation. If you don't get enough adjectives or nouns from your elevator pitch exercise, or if you just want to generate more of them, answer these questions. So what is the emotional tone of your work? Is it fun? Is it serious? Is it mysterious? Is it heavy? Is it moody? Then think about what is the actual subject or theme of your work? When you consider your book, what color comes to mind? Is it an accounting that focuses on a dark time, place, or era? Or is the light at the end of the tunnel the most important part? Is it a compilation of multiple stories with varying degrees of color, which is tone, and mood, which is darkness to light? Is it a tale of a golden hero saving the universe from a race of ancient tadpole beings? Does it follow the energetic journey of a fiery heroine who crosses the sea alone? Or is it about the crushing loss of a loved one or victory over an insidious disease? Think about this in very specific terms. Once you've done exercise number one and answered these questions on this page, you'll know a lot more about the best illustration decisions to make for your writing. Doing this exercise will also help you avoid using cliched symbols like guns, knives, white lilies, and poison vials for the cover of your mis murder mystery, or lacy lampshades and canopy beds for your Victorian romance. Instead, you might find through this exercise that solving your murder mystery hinges on the testimony of a child in a gingham pinafore. Now let's take that gingham pinafore and turn it into something that makes your spine tingle. What if your romantic heroine keeps a canary in her Victorian boudoir that eventually saves her life? The way you transform a gingham pinafore or a yellow bird into images that make you want to read the associated novel is through the use of color, tint, and contrast. This slide is of two mock book covers that are built on an identical image. 
Besides the text, the only difference is an adjustment in color tone. The dark image combined with the words at the bottom that say, or die trying, immediately makes you wonder if the immigrant lives or does die trying. Even though this cover was made in a hurry for this presentation and is super unfinished, it creates a powerful mystery in the mind of any potential reader. Readers who enjoy intrigue will pick up this book. The lighter image combined with the words poetic diary leaves little doubt that this book is about a journey that while it might have had some trials, it ended well. Readers who like poetry, true adventure that doesn't end with anyone losing a limb, who like sailing or the sea, will, will pick up this book. This is the beauty of connotation. And connotation is the visually accurate expression of a feeling. And as we go through, you're gonna see how important it is to consider the feeling that any images you use give to your work. The mood enhancing strength of color and contrast is why simple, easy to make abstract images like these can work as perfectly appropriate and inspiring art for book covers, chapter headings, backgrounds, and page embellishments. The images shown here were made from acrylic drip paintings, a kind of uncontrollable but easy art form. What you can control are the colors you choose. Select colors that match the mood of your writing, and in an afternoon, you can make dozens of beautiful images that perfectly match your desired connotations. You can see that a couple of these images required some coaxing to reveal themselves, and I'm just going to point out that I added eyes to two of these in order to bring what I was seeing out of the picture. On the first one, I kept the eyes kind of messy and not very refined. And on the second one, I refined the eye a little more because I felt like just adding a blob of additional color was just going to ooze into the rest of the, of the picture. So you can play with any images and refine them in any way you want or cut out pieces of these abstract kind of drip painted images. Um, on this image, I simply drew a piece of cardboard over the wet paint. And this one came from two paintings that I didn't like. So I took scissors to both of them. I cut out this section here because I thought it was interesting. And then I took the entire rest of the paintings and cut them into identical triangles. Um, and then I started just forming them into this tree. Um, what you can do with even the stuff you might throw away is pretty amazing. This is another mock book cover. It's the front and the back. And the four panels used came from one single drip painting that was then cut into quarters. Um, here you can see I actually cut one of the quarters in half again. These drip paintings are my answer to illustrating memoir, poetry, and prose without having to worry about any copyright infringements or paying an artist for images or getting your relatives to agree to let you print their pictures in your book. If you want to learn how to make these drip paintings, craft and hobby stores carry everything you need to start making your own drip paintings by this afternoon. They have books, uh, with detailed instructions and project su suggestions. And I include a hands-on drip painting session as part of my illustration for writers class. And I think I said before that hopefully it'll be offered again in the spring. This part of this slide just shows you what can be done using the exact same image panels. This is the exact same one painting taken to use as illustrations and as an illustrative thread throughout the work. So each page could also contain a bit of the same painting. And over here, we've got another way that some bits of the, of the same painting could be used, another page. But I wanted to point out here the ge that geometry is also a way of changing the mood of the work. Um, if you compare this to the tone of the previous page, it evokes a completely different kind of emotion. These are the same exact dripped acrylic images. They're just clipped into shapes. It's the same exact green background color. 
but it's just a different treatment and it does send quite a different message regardless of whether it has words or not. So now I'm going to move on a little bit and show you some examples of actually published illustrated memoir, poetry, and prose. <laughs> so this is Reed Drummond. She's the pioneer woman. If you haven't heard of her, she uh, created an empire as a blogger of her life as a city girl. She married a, a cowboy and ended up living in virtual seclusion on a ranch in Oklahoma. Since that marriage, she's written multiple cookbooks and books about homeschooling. She has a line of kitchenware that features in multiple aisles at Walmart. Each piece is accented with colorful country florals. These florals decorate her logo, her blog, her book illustrations, her signature, and every page of this book, which is her memoir. Her story would not be the same without these floral decorations. Instead of pictures of her husband, her babies, her sprawling ranch, or even pictures of herself winning Miss Congeniality and a beauty contest, which is what she talks about here, Reed Drummond's publisher chose to use downplayed illustrations that coincidentally or not, harken back to her brand. Also note that while her cover is a riot of bright color, the interior pages though quite illustrated, remain black and white. This is an elegant looking but economical choice for interior pages. You can see in this chapter page, um, she's got the flowers and each chapter actually has a different floral design on it. I just chose one at random. These are her section breaks. And this is a single page. All of the pages in her book have this floral decoration on left and right sides. On the other hand, Brooke Shields told her story in a pretty traditional way. She has an album of family photos in the center of the book, but she also includes actual copies of letters between her and her mother. She has quotes from even more letters that serve as illustrative divisions in section, illustrative elements, sorry, in section divisions. And that leads me to my tip number four, which is to consider that decorative text is part of illustration. Like white space, most people don't tend to think of inspirational quotes or other uh, pieces of text that aren't part of the actual storytelling text as illustration. But I would argue that anything that's not the text of your story, including chapter headings, illustrative text, and even page numbers is all part of your book's illustration. These things surround your writing and should help to explain your message. They are not just decorations. Each of these has the power to enhance or detract from the overall effect of your work, and you should consider your book as a total package, as a 100% creative work. All of its various aspects deserve the same consideration as the words. The images are seen first and they must catch your reader's eye and entice them to crack open the book and read your opening hook. This book is actually an autobiography, but I love it. Bob Hope wrote his entire autobiography in jokes. This choice illustrated his life in a way that no other form possibly could. So as you can see here, he has text which tells his story and he has jokes as illustrative text that paints a picture of what the story is about. And this, these jokes in this book are a form of illustration. So my next tip is number five, your book of memoir, poetry or prose is as unique as you are. So take a risk and put your personal stamp on it. Think about people who have a particular skill like embroidery or were a nurse in a war or a pandemic. And then consider the words that describe the objects used in that word, work or the work itself. These words are gold for, for finding connotative images. Remember though, as you're thinking of all of this, that the job of any illustration, including the cover, 
is to bring focus and clarity to your to the idea thread of your writing. You need to measure all images and other illustrative elements against how well they do this job. Just like we've been told a hundred times about dialogue. If that photo you and your uh, if that photo of you and your first kitten doesn't move your story forward somehow, it doesn't belong there. Next is how to be a good creature. This book is a National Book Award finalist, and I apologize, I didn't actually find what year it won that award. Um, mostly I was concerned ab about this book because I believe that Cy Montgomery stole my idea. One segment of stories from my life includes bats in the kitchen, bees in the fireplace, spiders in the bathroom, multiple bear encounters, and even a murdered mountain lion. These all played huge parts in shaping my childhood, and for a time, I considered animals as a good vehicle, the thread for telling my own memoir story. Then I stumbled upon this book, and it is such an excellent example of how images combined with a theme and good storytelling can capture and hold the hearts of many people, including publishers and critics. So is How to Be a Good Creature a sweet little book about animals? It kind of looks that way. But when you read an excerpt from this review by Lori Herzl from APNews.com, she says, it was animals that sent Cy Montgomery into a deep, nearly suicidal depression, and animals that rescued her and pulled her back. In How to Be a Good Creature, a memoir in 13 animals. Montgomery writes about her profound connection with animals, all animals, and how this became the focus of her life. So tip number six is to remember that the right illustrations are appropriate with even serious subjects. As writers, we sometimes consider that we're writing about a very serious idea, thought, or subject, and that illustrations would take away from the serious of the work. In my opinion, how to be a good creature really kind of debunks that myth. So the Bees of Paradise Camp is one page of one story from my own graphic memoir. I have come back around to the idea of animals as a good thread for plotting my stories, and that leads me to tip number seven. There are lots of illustrated tools out there that have been used or even overused to the point of being cliche but you might be the one to make some of them new again. So again, don't be afraid of any idea that you have. So my next activity for you has to do with 20 ways to make a turtle. As writers, we are advised that writers always write. This is excellent advice, of course, and I don't recommend that anyone drop their pencil and take up a paintbrush in order to create pictures for a single book. There are, however, many simple techniques anyone can use to generate dozens of pieces of art that can be used as general mood setters or as images depicting a specific subject. I've already shown you some possibilities from drip acrylic painting. These next two activities are well-known art and design techniques for generating ideas and translating them into images. So before I get on to this activity, um, I imagine that some of you have watched the CBS Sunday morning show, and it really is a perfect example of the unlimited amount of forms that can be created from a, around a single object. Each and every Sunday, the show's logo comes up in a different form. Sometimes on some episodes, it comes up in, in 10 or even 20 different forms. In an episode not too long ago, uh, they explained that viewers from around the world send the show's associate director, who is Jennifer Frank, sons made from every conceivable material, and they don't even use them all. But this is a show that has inspired people to create images of sons. Jessica Frank has gotten sons burnt into toast, sons made from crumpled up post-it notes, sons made from painted sunflower seeds. And one high school art class in Philadelphia has had more than 60 of their sons shown on the show. 
I first learned of the idea of representing a subject in 20 different ways as an assignment in a design class. It was early and I was working on my children's book, Where Does This Line Go? And the hero is a turtle. So I chose a turtle as my subject, hence 20 ways to make a turtle. So the first part of this activity is to do some quick research into the actual real physical structure and appearance of the subject of your choice. A quick way to do this is just to search Google for your subject pics. You will net hundreds, if not thousands of images of your subject, as well as examples of how that subject has been reproduced by others. Download only the images that speak to you. Don't try to get them all. <laughs> so I have these four over here, which were some, you know, just a few of all of the images I downloaded about turtles. I wanted to learn about the anatomy of turtles, so I have many, many pictures of turtles from the internet and, and their anatomy, how their bone structure works, how their muscle structure works, how their body is connected to the shell, how their feet move. And then this one, I really wanted to see, uh, I wanted to learn about their eye because I was having a trouble figuring out how does the eye go in the head? How big is the eye in compared to the rest of the head? And where does it sit in relation to the nose and the mouth? I also used this image because um, it was part of research I did on how the, um, how turtles, mouths actually look, how their nose and mouths look. And um, turtles are as unique as humans. Everyone is different and especially um, every type of turtle is different. I also did a lot of research on how the shells look in actual real life, um, how these little geometric shapes actually form a shell on the top here and on the bottom. So once you've downloaded some images that you like about your subject, you could look around your home. Writers often have objects in their home that are connected to the subjects they write about. Find, and look other places to find art objects or paintings of your chosen subject and take photos to include in your new reference library of images. And before I move on, just in case any of you want to see that video clip of, of CBS and the making of the suns, it's at this address right here. I hope you've had time to write it down if you want to. So the next part of this activity is to prescribe for yourself a certain number of ways, no less than 10 and no more than 100, to portray the subject of your work. Ideas for doing that include drawing it with standard art mediums. There's, you know, kids uh, watercolor sets. You don't have to spend a lot of money to find a way to draw something. Crayons will work. Charcoal pencils will work. Regular pencils will work. I like to get my hands dirty when I'm making art. It helps me feel a little bit more connected to it and I find that a lot of artists also feel that way. So if I was to use charcoal, I'd probably grab a briquette out of my barbecue and start drawing with that. Um, you can make your art creation, then you can take a uh, photograph of it, which allows you to play with it even further. One of the easiest things to do is you take the photograph, you print it, you put tracing paper over it, and then you trace just the elements that you want to keep. You can expand or contract certain elements to give it a cartoonish feel. Um, besides drawing with standard art mediums, you can draw your chosen subject in the sand, in ice cream, what the heck. Um, you can draw it in burnt butter, or you can take the burnt butter on your finger and put it in on a piece of paper and see what happens when the butter seeps into the page. Uh, you can make sculptures from rocks, flowers, or trash. This activity might appear challenging at first, but it quickly becomes a lot of fun. And if you have trouble with it, get some kids to help. They're great at this. So I just wanna call your attention to a couple of these uh, objects. The first I call my bucket turtle. At the time I created him, I was pretty proud. I have used him since, or variations of him for several design assignments and in classes and presentations. 
Um, when I made him, I had just started with image making and didn't consider myself at all creative by then. When this guy appeared out of discarded objects in my garden and trash, I felt like I had crossed a formidable creative boundary. Sometimes you really have to consider that you just work with this and work with this and it's the little things that come out of it that make you see what you're really capable of. I'd also like to point out that even if you think you have the perfect image for your book, I do still recommend doing these exercises. At the end of them, if you want to stick with your original idea, then okay, you've had some fun playing with art and you've built even greater confidence in the image because you now know for sure that it will indeed clarify the message of your book. So this is just another part of the exercise where um, I took two lilac leaves, a couple of open sunflowers and a closed sunflower and a bit of sage and shoved them together just like a kid would do in made a face. It's the easiest thing in the world. We all instinctively make faces. But then I thought, well, I think I'll turn that sprig of sage over and make it a sad face. And so then I had that and I took a picture and I did what, just what I said is I put tracing paper over the picture and traced around the elements that I thought were interesting or that I wanted to keep. You can see I didn't use the flower petals for this particular one, although I could have. I just traced the basics and I just barely noticed the nose here. And I kept this, the sad face. So then when you take away the photograph and you have just the tracing, this is what you end up with. To me, it looked like a pig. So I started filling in with these elements of the face and it's just really filling in the nose and the eyes. But I looked at him and I said, well, it's a pig face, but he's kind of incomplete. So then he had to have just, just a hint of a body, nothing more. And of course, a little round curly tail. So from flower petals, I was just arranging on the patio, probably having wine. <laughs> I have this petulant kind of cartoon pig, and I can use them for anything. So just a few more examples of illustrated memoir, poetry, and prose. These are some of my favorites. Um, some of you probably are familiar with Brian Andreas throughout the 90s and early 2000s. He made an empire, an empire from bad art and sometimes not even that great of writing. He took his imageries, his images and prose and made them into brightly colored posters, 3D wall art, greeting cards, and lots and lots of books. Some of his books are in color and some aren't. Brian Andreas was really a hero of mine because anyone could see that these are not refined images. And in my mind, he just decided he was an artist and he became one. And anyone can do that. The Man Who Planted Trees is a, really a short story. Um, it's, it's a short story. I don't think it's even more, it's not more than uh, 50 partial pages in a small book. Um, and this is another of my uh, favorite books. The image here, um, well, these, both of these two images are probably the most complicated ones in the book. Um, these are basically sketches, anything that has, uh, he has sketches of trees, and then they're filled in in this kind of sepia tone shading. They're really fun. They're very easy. Anyone could do this. And um, to end off my examples, I actually wanted to showcase um, another artist who I really think a lot of, and that's Gail Laura Dunn, one of our own members. Her creative work I really admire. Um, and I also think that her chat, chat books perfectly illustrate the idea that you can make your own book into something wonderful and artistic without spending an arm and a leg. Good, perfectly acceptable, and possibly even brilliant art is right at your own fingertips. And publishing it can be as easy as fabulous pen and ink drawings on white paper bound by colored cardstock and staples. These are the types of memoirs or books of poetry that you may never get to a mainstream publisher, but which I guarantee 
your family will love and cherish long after you've gone because it's personal from start to finish. It's, it's all you. And I think this is what a lot of families really want. So you say you're still not persuaded to try your hand at creating art. So let's consider this last, this, this tip number eight. No matter how brilliant the professional illustrator or designer you hire, they can't see the pictures inside your head. If you have no thought of ever trying your hand at art, let me just say that doing the three exercises and creating some of your own bad art examples in any crude form could save you many expensive hours build while you try to communicate your vision to an artist. If you have a, a scrapbook or a portfolio of all of these images that you've researched and the work that you've done to fine tune the image that you think best enhances the words that you've spent so much time writing, you can give this to any artist that you hire and they will be so grateful <laughs> to have the information and to have a clear vision that matches your vision. So don't set it you know what I've said aside just because you um, know that you're gonna that you know what you want to do and that you're gonna hire an illustrator. That being said, here are just a few ideas for hiring an artist. Even the best artist author fit is going to require a compromise. The artist whose work you most remind most admire and dream of having included in your book may not be at all compatible with your personality or the way you work, or with your pocketbook. That being a given, you might then think that your granddaughter is the perfect artist for you. Then she gets a boyfriend who steals her heart. I once even tried working with a tattooed, tattoo artist. It was the experience that sent me over the edge and made me realize I'd probably get my illustrations done faster if I learned to draw and did it myself. Once you've decided to hire an artist, you will want to work with someone who's at least somewhat professional. Besides having artistic ability and a style you appreciate, your artist needs to pay attention to returning your calls and to meeting the deadlines you've mutually agreed upon. So you'll want to investigate all candidates before entering into any agreements, because once you've signed any piece of paper, it's binding just like any other contract. So my first suggestion is to look over each candidate's website for information about their skill and experience. Then look at the site with attention to how it makes you feel. The way a site makes you feel matters. Art for your book needs to communicate the emotional tone of your work. So honor the way any artist's website or body of work feels to you. Once you've found some people whose art seems to match your vision for what you want for your book, conduct some in-person interviews and ask each artist to bring examples of some of their most recent work. Have a chat with them and intentionally, I know this sounds harsh to some of you, push a few buttons about the art they've brought. What you need to know is how this artist takes criticism and handles your feedback because most contracts devolve due to one person feeling like they have the right to offer criticism and the other not being able to handle it very well. My tip number nine is once you commit to working with a particular artist, be prepared to trust them. Ask questions, but trust the answers. If you've done your hiring properly, You'll be working with someone who is familiar with the rules of good design and will sincerely want to apply them to make your images the best they can be. I've actually never met an artist, even the tattoo guy, who didn't want every image they made to be their best. With patience and communication, your book can be the beneficiary of this drive that they have towards artistic perfection. So my final tip is allow yourself to make art freely and badly. It will open your mind and it just might make you a better writer. Thank you.